here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman, as we continue our conversation with Yanis Varoufakis, economist, author of the new book, Adults in the Room, My Battle with the European and American Deep Establishment. Yanis Varoufakis served as finance minister in Greece in 2015, before resigning from the city's government, famous for his negotiations with the International Monetary Fund and the European Union, as he dealt with Germany and other countries, later launched the Democracy in Europe Movement 2025 known as DiEM25. Um, so, the subtitle of your book, Adults in the Room, is My Battle with the European and American Deep Establishment. What is that? Well, it used to be in the United States. Remember President Eisenhower? It used to be the military industrial complex, the medical industrial complex. In Europe, it was the cartel of big business, heavy industry. I recall the first name of the European Union. It was called the European Community uh, for Coal and Steel. So, it was like OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, it was a cartel for big business. Uh, but then, with uh, the collapse of the Bretton Woods period, after the Nixon shock in 1971, you have the rise of the financial sector. Banks start becoming uh, absolutely significant, and far more significant than industries like car making, like steel making, like coal. So, financialization created a new uh, deep establishment that um, included the revolving doors, remember, in the 1990s, when people from Goldman Sachs well, what the 1990s is happening today as we speak. Free people from Goldman Sachs took over the, the Treasury, <laughs> and then people who were in the Treasury retired and went to Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan. So now we the deep establishment comprises primarily the banking community their connections through the revolving doors with uh, the administration uh, in Washington, D.C., in this country, in Brussels, and various centers of government, particularly Germany and Paris, in Europe, and the way that they have co co-opted the systemic media uh, uh, and journalists who acquire inside information only to the extent that they become functional to the interests of this deep establishment. So, explain. Let's go back to 2015, yes. to what happened. I mean, you became this famous figure who was clashing with—I mean, the picture on the front of the book, uh, you have Merkel, you have Hollande uh, in yes. France, and you have uh, President Obama. Merkel looks surprised. President Obama is smiling. Um, talk about your dealings with these leaders. Well, this is not a book about villains and heroes. This is— the way I, I conceptualized it, especially after I was uh, out of those corridors, once I had resigned, I conceptualized it as a genuine tragedy, a Shakespearean tragedy. Because, you know, when you watch King Lear or Macbeth, you realize that uh, these extremely, supremely powerful people, characters that you encounter on stage, are exceptionally powerless at the same time. So I remember my conversation, one conversation I had with Barack Obama. He was extremely supportive of what I was trying to do, and yet completely powerless to do anything about that. Jack Clue, the U.S. Treasury Secretary, was absolutely straightforward on this. Yes, I was right, but no, uh, America did not have what it took anymore, or the interest, to, to, to intervene. What were you trying to do? Well, I was simply trying to get our people out of debtor's prison, which is what Puer the Puerto Ricans uh, now deserve, uh, an escape from uh, a permanent um, debt prison. Um, to put it very briefly, Amy, in 2010, the Greek state went bankrupt. Let's not get into the reasons as to why it happened. It's a fact, just like Puerto Rico. Uh, and the great and the good decided to conceal fraudulently that bankruptcy. And the only reason, the only way you can conceal a bankruptcy is by giving a very large loan. So we got the largest loan in human history, not to, for the Greek people, of course. Uh, all of that, of that money was given to us so that we can bail out, we can give it back to the German and the French banks. And this was done fraudulently, because the German and the French leadership and the Greek leadership went to the parliaments and effectively said that this was an act of solidarity with the people of Greece, when it was an act of solidarity with the bankers. But, of course, they, they never told their parliamentarians that this was an act of solidarity with the bankers. And they promised the people in you know, the, the German parliament, for instance, Angela Merkel promised the German parliament that this was a loan that was given to Greece for solidaristic purposes, uh, and the Germans would get all their money back with interest. That was never going 
to be the case, because when you give a huge amount of money to a bankrupt entity on conditions of austerity that shrink that entity's income, there's no way you're going to get your money back, not because the debtor doesn't want to give it, but it is absolutely impossible to pay it back, like Puerto Rico today. And then, of course, once you commit that crime against logic and you lie to your parliament, like Angela Merkel did in the Bundestag, in the federal parliament in Berlin, then you are like Macbeth. You commit one crime, you have to commit a second crime to cover up the first crime, and then a third crime. Or to put it in financial terms, if you try to repay a mortgage by means of a credit card, then you need a second credit card to repay the first credit card, and the third to the second. And I was just trying to get Greece out of that spiral to desertification. Why did you quit? Because my prime minister uh, surrendered to the creditors. And I was not prepared to do the same. You're talking about uh, the Greek Prime Minister Tsipras. Alexis Tsipras. Um, so, in 2016, the Greek Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras said he was surprised Donald Trump had become the leading contender to win the U.S. presidential race and said he hoped, quote, what this nomination marks, the ideas it represents, the appeal it reaches, and the threat to become even president, I hope we will not face this evil. And then you had, just a few weeks ago, there was the Greek prime minister, um, Alexis Tsipras, standing with President Trump at the White House. When Trump was asked about what he had said, because he had some nice words for Tsipras, uh, he said, oh, I guess I should have been informed of this before I had those nice words. Um, what about what happened in the White House two weeks ago when Tsipras came? And can you talk about your uh, split with him and what you feel needs to happen? You say Greece was the beginning of Brexit. I have no doubt it was. I campaigned in Britain against Brexit. I gave th speeches in 13 c uh, towns and cities uh, before Brexit, against Brexit. And the good people, mostly left-wingers, who came and progressives to listen to me, uh, would come to me afterwards and say, look, we really like you, we really agree with you on your, with your analysis, but we cannot vote to stay in the European Union after the way you were treated. So, you know, this was a very paradoxical situation to find myself in. And look, remember, Brexit won with 1.8 percent of the vote. Um, if only three or four or five percent of those who voted in favor of Brexit were motivated by the crashing of our government and of our democracy, you know, we are in democracy now, Amy. Our democracy was crushed, like Puerto, Puerto Rico's democracy was eliminated. Our democracy has been eliminated. Um, my friend, former comrade uh, Alexis Tsipras, is a prime minister of Greece. He has less power than the mayor of a small town in the United States, because, you know, sovereignty has completely shifted to uh, a group of bailiffs called the Troika of lenders. Uh, by the way, to go back to the, to, to the White House, the sight of my former comrade um, bowing his head to Donald Trump after everything he and I used to say about Donald Trump and about the old right and about the rise of xenophobic populism was an extremely sad moment for me. And it was also against the national interests of Greece, because hobnobbing with the Donald is not going to help Greece in any way. The Donald is not going to do anything to Obama, — Obama did not do anything to intervene uh, to get our people out of debtors' prison. Uh, and, you know, the only thing that they actually did was to sign a $2.5 billion or euro deal to refurbish uh, uh, the Greek Air Force's American-sourced planes, uh, which, of course, Donald Trump really liked, in a country where people are finding it difficult to put food on the table, where we have refugees that are living in conditions that are despicable and a scourge and a blight on the integrity and soul of Europe, to spend money now refurbishing uh, airplanes in order to satisfy, to some extent, fleetingly, Donald Trump. Um, is an abomination. I want to ask you quickly. Earlier this year, members of the neo-Nazi Golden Dawn Party held a torchlight parade in Athens, Greece, calling for a ban on migrants entering Greece. Among those marching was Golden Dawn Parliament member Ilias Panagiotaros, who praised President Trump's ban on Muslim refugees and immigrants. We just see tens of thousands of illegal immigrants in our country, uh, and hundreds thousands others that have already come to Greece years ago, and our country is uh, an open field. Everyone can come whenever they want, and they can live whenever they want. 
We would like to follow uh, a policy like uh, Donald Trump is doing in the States right now. Golden Dawn is the third largest party in the Greek parliament. Its members have been arrested for assaulting and murdering immigrants and political opponents. The group's emblem is a red and black flag resembling a swastika. In October, the party endorsed Donald Trump in the U.S. election. You've been personally threatened by the man whose voice we just played. Well, yes, he threatened any progressive um, minister that was sitting opposite him in parliament. This is what the, the worst aspect of it, to, be, to see these Nazis. They're not new Nazis. There's nothing new about them. They're fully-fledged, old-fashioned Nazis. But, yeah, Amy, you know what is the, the, the worst aspect of it all? That the, the, the only good thing about them is that they are thugs, so their proportion of the vote is not rising very fast. But their policies have infiltrated the mainstream, not just in Greece. Think of the new Austrian government. Their number one priority is to erect taller borders to, to fence the refugees out. Think of the IFD, the alternative for Deutschland. It's spreading throughout Europe. The worst aspect of the rise of Nazism today is that it, th their policies are winning independently of whether they're winning government. So you have Golden Dawn endorsing President Trump. He becomes president. And you are in this city, in New York City, with this terror attack that just occurred. Um, uh, eight people killed. And President Trump's immediate response is to try to crack down on immigration. You say that is the response that will actually promote terror. Explain. Well, Amy, ISIS loves Donald Trump. He is the best recruitment officer for ISIS. Because what ISIS wants is they want us, our societies, <coughs> to turn against migrants, to become xenophobic, to assault them on the streets of our cities, to fence them out of our countries, because that is the way that they will breed um, hatred within their own communities, of Muslims, for instance, and recruit them to ISIS. Uh, I think that, being here in New York, I'm, I have to say that I'm very pleased, because there is there's good news always, and we should focus on the good news. By the way that the people of New York are responding calmly, democratically, to the uh, tragedy that befell them, without grudges and without Donald Trump's uh, uh, reaction, which is, you know, we have ten. We have 10 seconds. I want to touch on Catalonia. Massive yes. protests in Barcelona. You're headed there next week. Um, uh, many government ministers have now of Catalonia have now been jailed so now by we the have Spanish government. prisoners in Europe. This is fantastic, isn't it? It's look. It's it's just complete utter radical idiocy. Uh, imagine if the London government... Remember two years ago the Scots had a referendum? We have 10 seconds. Imagine if the London government had sent the troops in to beat up voters in the polling stations. Scotland would have been out of the United Kingdom. What is Madrid doing, trying to get rid of Catalonia? Yanis Varoufakis, we're going to do part two of this discussion. We'll post online at democracynow.org. Economist, author of the new book, Adults in the Room, My Battle with the European and American Deep Establishment. That does it for our show. I'll be speaking in Buffalo tonight.